So in the first lecture, um, what we did was talk about um, how it is that sociologists understand health and illness and how they understand health and illness as a social construction and something that's socially patterned. In this lecture, we're going to talk about how healthcare um, reflects ideologies and provide a broad kind of public health model, um, uh, an ecological model for understanding health in a society. So um, healthcare reflecting ideologies is a different way of saying that um, uh, we ask ourselves all the time, who is worthy of a healthy and fulfilling life? Is it everyone or not really? Do we not have an obligation to make sure that everyone has a healthy and fulfilling life? Almost no society thinks that everyone is worthy of a healthy and fulfilling life, in part because most societies define who's worthy of living a healthy and fulfilling life within what they think of as the bounds of their society. So in the United States, um, there's little sense of our obligation to um, uh, people in Botswana having a healthy and fulfilling life. Some of us may have that as a commitment, but it's probably a pretty weak commitment. We may say that we have that commitment, but chances are we do very little to realize that commitment. And so usually it's bound national, um, uh, uh, that there's some national bounds to who uh, is entitled to a healthy and fulfilling life. And even within those national bounds, um, uh, typically it's circumscribed even more narrowly. So it's not just that people um, uh, within um, uh, our nation, uh, but people who we think of as legitimate people um, uh, 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 within our nation. So many, for example, would say that even though there are um, people who work in this country um, and who have been here for over a decade, insofar as they are undocumented, they are not worthy of a health and healthy and fulfilling life. We do not have obligations to make sure that that happens. And so um, uh, others uh, think about this in deeply racial terms, that, um, uh, um, that uh, uh, Native Americans should just, they're responsible for themselves. They have their own um, uh, lands and it's not really our job to do anything about it. Um, or uh, there are enough resources that go to black people. Why should we care about this? Um, they need to take responsibility for themselves, et cetera. And so um, uh, when we ask who is worthy of a healthy and fulfilling life, often the answer to that question is influenced by our understandings of what a society should be like and who is a legitimate member of society. Our healthcare system is embedded within our larger society. And it reflects the ideas, values, and ideologies of our society. We've spent decades debating how to best distribute healthcare in society. Um, and on the surface, it might seem like these debates are about whether healthcare is a right or a commodity. You know, healthcare is a right, or is it something that we can purchase? Um, more fundamentally, though, our healthcare system at any given time reflects who we as a society deem worthy of a healthy life. And in general, in the United States, we deem elderly people as worthy of having a healthy life, and we deem working people um, uh, uh, um, worthy of a healthy and fulfilling life if they make enough money. If they don't make enough money, we deem them to be not worthy of having a healthy and fulfilling life. Um, why do I say that? Um, because we tolerate having tens of millions of people in the United States without health care, many of them um, uh, people who work. And so we have said to ourselves, these people are not worthy of a healthy and fulfilling life uh, because they're not leading good lives themselves, they're not making good choices, um, uh, or because they're poor. Um, and uh, we try, and for the most part, our relatively successful at providing health to children in the society. But if you were a working age adult, um, uh, we basically think that you're not really worthy of a healthy and fulfilling life un unless um, you're reasonably well off. Uh, and our healthcare system reflects that. It reflects 
the choice that we have made and that we continue to make every day, um, it, which is a choice that says we're not really going to do anything to help the tens of millions of people without health care. Um, and that is not consistent with what other um, societies have done. Now, the Affordable Care Act, um, which is sometimes referred to as Obamacare, uh, uh, tried to um, provide uh, greater access to health. And so uh, this meant the establishment of health exchanges where people could shop for health insurance and um, insurances were required to, recover, to cover certain essential services uh, that insurers were required to cover people regardless of their health status. Um, uh, so regardless of pre-existing conditions, um, the expansion of Medicaid, which was for poor people, uh, to cover more people and that Americans um, would be required if they worked to have health insurance. The Medicaid expansion and the um, work requirements have both been overturned. Um, and it argued that employers with more than 50 employees must provide health insurance and that coverage is extended to families and children until they were 26 years old. So the children had some period of extension. Um, the expansion of Medicaid was challenged and overturned and states now have the option of expanding Medicaid themselves or not. And the individual mandate required that Americans have health insurance above certain wages and that also with the uh, overturned. And with these two features, basically the Affordable Care Act is not coming close to achieving um, what we would call universal coverage, everyone covered by health insurance. And so, as I said, currently tens of millions of Americans do not have any health insurance. And this is part of an ideological commitment on our part um, to say that those people, um, unless uh, they make some kind of different sets of choices, are not worthy of a healthy um, uh, um, uh, life or worthy of health care. And this should lead us to think about, um, uh, again, some of the social patterns that um, uh, influence access to health. But in order to more fully see this, I want to provide a kind of um, sociological picture of an understanding of what affects our health. So sociological or a social understanding of what influences our health. And the reason that I want to do this is to show how, um, uh, again, health is not just a consequence of individual choice, but that there are many things that influence our health. And the analogy that we often use when um, trying to evoke this idea is that of upstream and downstream. So medicine tends to focus downstream, clinical, behavioral, and biological aspects of health. Um, so, uh, and sociology tends to focus upstream on the social forces that drive social health patterns. Moving upstream in part means trying to think about the sets of things that could be changed in the broader environment that could prevent problems from happening in the first place. So downstream is partially, how do we treat problems when they emerge? And how do we understand some of the reasons why they emerge? So what are the clinical, behavioral, and biological aspects of health and disease? Upstream is like, what are the broader patterns that make the problems happen in the first place? So the social determinants of health often result in socio socio social inequalities in health. And the sociological focus is to look and say, what if we looked way upstream? Let me give you an example of this, um, of a public health approach um, uh, that comes primarily uh, over uh, out of my own research. Um, so recently I've been um, writing a lot on sexual assault. And um, one of the uh, comments about that work has been to say that we need to focus more upstream on sexual assault. What that means is that instead of saying, how do we adjudicate cases after they've happened? So what do we do after a sexual assault happens? Moving upstream means what do we do to prevent the sexual assault before it happens? So are there things that we can do before we get to the moment of an assault that could make the assault less likely? It's not that the downstream things are unimportant successfully adjudicating cases so that people feel like they've experienced justice, that some of the harm that has been done 
um, has been addressed by the collectivity and by the individuals. That's a valuable thing. But so too would it be to say, what if the rate could be lower? What if we found ways to reduce the likelihood of this thing ever before it ever happens? That's a way of looking at what forms of prevention might be possible and how prevention might be possible by um, uh, adjusting the social dynamics of the phenomenon. So this means thinking about the social determinants of health. And these are the aspects of society that can impact health. Um, um, and the, some of the social determinants of health are listed on this slide, race, ethnicity, and structural racism, gender and structural sexism, socioeconomic class or status positions, your social networks, the neighborhoods that you're in, the experience of stigma and stress. And stress is um, often socially constituted. It's part of um, being part of a particular kind of social community that generates stress. It's situationally constituted as well. That's why we think of it as social. We've talked a little bit about neighborhoods. I've talked throughout all of these lectures um, and in this one as well about uh, race, class, and gender. And we'll think about how social networks and stigma matter as well. The determinants that we most frequently study for uh, the social determinants of health are race, ethnicity, um, and uh, socioeconomic status. Um, and more recently, um, sociologists have begun to focus a lot more on social networks, neighborhood stigma, and stress. And um, uh, we're also expanding this to think about religion and um, sexual identity for helping to make sense of the social determinants of health. Um, uh, the emphasis on race, ethnicity, um, gender, and socioeconomic status has generally been very variable-based. And variable-based meaning what do people with this racial or ethnic identity or of this class position experience? Um, what are the differences between groups? But that, that focus is pivoting um, more recently, and it's pivoting to focus um, less on variable-based differences, variable-based differences, and more on structural conditions. What does that mean? It means looking at structural racism, structural sexism, and classism. So um, what would an example of structural sexism, structural racism, structural uh, classism be? Um, well, uh, I'd like you to think about that for a moment because we've been speaking a lot about race as a social institution, about gender as a social institution. And we've spoken less about it, but we can also think about class as a social institution. So what is it about the institutions that we belong to that might help produce racial differences or gendered differences or class differences in health? What are aspects of how institutions are arranged that could generate these outcomes? So this means let's not just look at what the behavioral differences are between the groups, um, but instead ask how our organization of society might build into its very structure negative outcomes for different groups. So one example of structural racism would be patterns of segregation patterns of segregation that are sustained through a range of laws, like zoning laws, um, which continue to create highly concentrated racialized neighborhoods. And this would be an example of structural racism, which has little to do with the properties of, say, African Americans, and a lot to do with the social policies that construct um, uh, neighborhoods in a particular way, that particular way being along the lines of race. Um, others could be um, how uh, um, health policies uh, around maternity leave um, are structural sexism. Um, so uh, the fact that in the United States, um, uh, women experience no right to paid maternity leave is a form of structural sexism, and that may influence women's health behavior. So here we would look at the policies, institutional dynamics, and organizational rules that help produce race, gender, and class. Um, produce those things that generate 
some of the, the, the health outcomes. So that from a social determinants of health perspective, um, looking at these differences by race, class, and gender doesn't just mean looking at people, but it means looking at the institutional rules and policies that produce people. Stigma and stress serve as the reason linking the other determinants of health. So it may be that there are stressful features of networks or um, uh, stressful features of sexism that result in negative health patterns. So um, uh, uh, what does that mean? Um, what it means is that uh, um, uh, people may experience a stigmatized identity, an identity that um, is seen as not changeable um, and that results in negative um, interpretations by others within a society. So um, uh, coming from a working class or, or poor background can be a stigmatized identity. People may make fun of how you pronounce particular words. People may say, oh my God, you're so trashy. Um, um, so that there would be phrases like, oh, somebody is poor white trash or they're very ghetto. And these are phrases that stigmatize individuals from their, uh, given their social background and suggesting that they're from a particular kind of background or neighborhood or um, experience that is a bad one. This can induce all kinds of negative impacts upon people. Think about what it feels like, for example, to be insulted about your social background and how that insult um, um, can result in mental health challenges. It may result in your engaging in behaviors um, um, that are not particularly healthy that we would describe as quote unquote self-destructive. Stigmatization and stress have significant impacts on people's health and such stigmatization and stress are often socially produced. They are things that we do to others or that Put differently, people have done to them. Um, the stress that working class people are under uh, is truly profound. Um, uh, uh, the stress of not knowing whether or not you're going to have enough money to be able to pay for your rent or for your children's medicine or other things like that is a tremendous stress which has significant health impacts. Um, uh, stress is deadly. And the people who experience the highest degrees of stress tend to be people who are poor. Research on poverty, for example, notes that poverty is very cognitively taxing. What does that mean? It means that to be poor occupies an enormous, or requires an enormous amount of cognitive effort to constantly be thinking about things. You have to do that in, in, in ways that rich people just don't. Um, so, uh, um, I do not live in the condition of poverty. And one of the things I never really think about is where my food is going to come from, uh, today, tomorrow, this week, or even this month. Um, I just know that I'll be able to get food somehow. It's not something I ever have to think about. Um, if I don't have enough food in my fridge, I can order food or quickly go to the grocery store and buy whatever I want. Poor people don't experience that. They experience a kind of cognitive taxation, a cognitive taxation um, because they constantly have to wonder, where is my food going to come from today? Where is it going to come from tomorrow? Where is it going to come from this morning? Where is it going to come from this evening? Um, what are the consequences of my going to bed hungry? These are significant taxations on people that induce stress. I also noted um, uh, in the first lecture uh, that we see huge differences in stress depending upon your position within a social hierarchy. So if you've ever been at the bottom of a social hierarchy, um, you know how stressful it can be um, and how brutal that experience can be where um, you experience people brutalizing. Um, uh, because of your position. So this might be something where you think about what it was like to be a freshman or in your first years in high school versus a senior um, or a new member of a team um, um, versus one who'd been on the team for a while. Uh, people remind you of your social position and the greater 
the hierarchy. The stronger the hierarchy, the, the bigger degree of a hierarchy, the more stressful the experience is at the bottom. As I've mentioned before, looking at different primate societies, different kinds of primates. So if you look at bonobos versus gorilla, gorillas, excuse me, um, versus other kinds of primates, they have different hierarchical structures. Some of them are really hierarchical and some of them are much, much more equal. And one of the findings among primatologists, people who research these different primate groups, is that those primate societies that are really unequal, that have huge differences between the person in power and the person who's dominated, the dominated people die at much younger ages than the dominant people. Primate societies that are more equal have a more equal distribution of death, um, that they generally age to similar levels. So this all points to the social determinant of health that the amount of stress that you have, the stigma that you experience, the neighborhoods that you're in, all influence you. The final thing I'll point to are your social networks. Um, and this um, emerges in part out of observations made by um, Nicholas Christakis, where um, he was a physician and sociologist who noted that all kinds of things, um, health outcomes are contagious through networks, but where the health outcome itself isn't contagious. So it's not like, you know, the, the insight here wasn't like, oh, the flu is contagious. You can get the flu from other people. It was that things that don't seem like they should be contagious are likely contagious through networks. So in Christophus' instance, he was interested in how heart attacks seemed to be contagious. That if you had friends who experienced heart attacks, um, you're, you may experience a heart attack or obesity was contagious. If you, in your network, obesity tended to move through networks. The insight here is that the people around you influence your health. The networks of association that you have influence both your behaviors and your outcomes. All of this, race, ethnicity, gender, class, networks, neighborhoods, stigma, and stress, point to how health outcomes are not just a product of your own behavior. Instead, health outcomes are also a product of the relationships that you are embedded within. So that when we look to see why it is that there are differences in health, we can't just look to say, what are people doing that produces that health? We also have to ask, what is being done to them that produces that health outcome? Um, again, this is a classic approach of the sociologist which is to say behavior matters, but behaviors are typically produced under social conditions not of our own making, or not strictly of our own making. We are born into certain racial and ethnic categories, into a gender assignment. We are born into a class position. Um, um, we live in particular neighborhoods when we're children. Um, we also experience different stigma and stress from other people. All of these things influence us and our behaviors, but all of those influences impact our health.